Yeah. What I want to talk about uh, initially are some of the projects that I visited and that we, we have some photographs of and, and give you some examples of things that have been working really nicely. Uh, what you got in a, in a nutshell from Greg is the kind of conversation that will benefit you and that is actually essential when you start thinking about doing something in a park, which is to talk to somebody who works on the property and get them to give you feedback on the kinds of environmental issues or limitations that you might need to actually take into consideration if you're going to do something in that particular place. They can tell you what you have access to, like shelters, spaces for you to use, what kind of weather may be an issue, but also when high impact, uh, when high use times uh, happen at parks so that you can maybe avoid those. Uh, as you see coming in today, if you were having something that was time specific like this workshop, it would be a challenge to get people to come in and maybe have access to it if they weren't already here. So the park staff is going to be able to tell you the best times of year for you to do stuff. But anyway, this was... Um, this is a series of art projects, art classes, painting classes at Shackamack, which is down uh, further in the uh, south of the state. And the woman who um, is doing this, her name is Stacy Sam, and she's actually had a series of, I think, 12 painting classes, different uh, dates that has, have happened through the year. They're still going on. They started in the spring. And so what she did was she has people doing... Um, landscapes or, or other uh, subjects that are specific to that state park. Uh, she worked in a shelter, and the, the day I was there, uh, the weather was really horrendous. And so there was some question about whether it would happen, but it worked out because she had accounted for what happens if it rains. Uh, we thought there might be a tornado, but there wasn't, so the class went on. And so, and she worked very closely with park staff to suss out what might happen if they had to get people out of there. And I was there, and, and so there was very close communication between Stacy and the naturalist who was on site. Uh, this was a nature tile project at Spring Mill State Park. Um, it involved flora that were not collected at the park. So very often when people are doing uh, projects that require natural materials, they're very clear when they're talking to participants that the stuff that they're using the plant materials were, was, were not collected from the park. So if you're doing stuff that, that, that draws on natural materials, you will not be collecting it from the park, and you'll want to educate your participants about not doing that as well. I attended a, a sweetgrass basket weeding workshop at Prophetstown State Park, which is beautiful, just outside of Lafayette. It's a, a prairie. And the grasses that we used were actually not collected from the site. Uh, so that was an important thing for that instructor to note. This was Sherry Wagner, who happens to be the Poet Laureate for the state, has had a series of, I think it's four, poetry hikes, and I attended one. And Sherry's series is a really nice example of a project that is very closely tied to that specific place, not just the environment, the landscape, but also the built environment, the history of Fort Harrison. And so one, the day that I went, we were, talk, we were working on uh, poetry, uh, poetry prompts that came from the history of the site. She worked with the interpreter, and we, we went in the Nature Center, and we did stuff. So it was really a fully integrated, um, really very site-specific project. It was inspiring and, and really interesting. The thing that you'll see here, this text, is a portion of an email that she sent to all of the participants. Some of these events, this is an example, and the, the painting classes at Shackamack are another example, where uh, the artist who designs the project has people register. And so in the uh, lead up to this event, Sherry sent really specific informational emails to the participants to say this is what to expect, these are the clothes to bring. It was, it was really useful and that, that interim communication when you have people signing up for a class is great because it keeps them engaged because so, anybody who's ever done 
uh, free programming, you know that sometimes people will sign up and they may not show up because you haven't paid for it. So that nice communication really lets them know that they're going to be doing something fun and special and that, they're, that you're going to be looking out for them. And this was just a, it was a wonderful experience and Sherry did great work there. Uh, she uses different parts of the park. She used uh, a programming room, she used the nature center, and she had people out on the trails. And she also had to deal with, with weather issues and so she always had a backup. So if you got, if, if there was rain, she would email people, she'd keep an eye on the weather. So if you have an event uh, and uh, it's coming up and the weather looks iffy, you'll want to communicate with your participants if you have a, if you have a list of people. Um, this is a, a nice example of another level of communications that uh, artists will want to have. Now, what you'll see on the left was actually produced, or actually both of these things were produced by, I think, the DNR. Um, that particular park on the left, that was a calendar of events that the Brown County uh, staff put up for all of their Arts in the Parks events that they had in the park. The sign on the right is a banner sign that um, it's just, it's for a Fort Wayne Youth Theater event. What I'd like to say about the signage is that when, if you do a, uh, a grant application, it, there's a mention of promotion, promotional materials. Uh, small, simple signage is really helpful in guiding people to your event in a park. And I say that as somebody who spent a lot of my summer looking for arts in the park events in parks. And parks can be huge, they can be small, they can have a lot going on. And I have found that when I'm coming up to a park and I know that there is an event that's gonna happen, it's really helpful if there's even just a little yard sign out near the entrance to the park that says Clay Day today in, in Brown County. Uh, and to have a little sign near where you're doing your thing so that once you get there, you know that you're there. It seems like a small thing, but it's really important because you've been to this place on a day like today and there's all this stuff going on. Depending on what parks you're familiar with, parks can be vast networks of roads and trails. And so the more you can do to help people find their way to what you are doing, the better, because they won't get lost or discouraged if they're winding their way through a bunch of trails. So signage is great, uh, and you can budget for it. Um, and that is that. But I want to follow up before I finish up with some general comments about some of, of these projects and the process for developing your projects. So in the description, in the packet that you have that um, Paige handed you that gives you Arts in the Parks background, there's a description that this is a collaborative legacy program. And the word collaborative is really important because your communication with park staff will make your Arts in the, project, Arts in the Park project stronger, for sure. Your familiarity with the park environment, its landscape, uh, its history, and the people who manage it will also make your project stronger. And it will probably give you some really interesting ideas for what you might want to do. Even if you're working from existing work that you already do, let the park and that environment inform your project design. In my experience this summer visiting park projects, the strongest, and by strongest I mean the most interesting and engaging from the point of view of an audience member or an attendee, are projects that have been ones that are really firmly rooted in place. And in that uh, description of the Arts and the Parks projects, a phrase uh, tailored to the unique assets of each site is a, is a key phrase. In other words, your project couldn't just be lifted whole cloth and done someplace else without any difference, uh, any noticeable difference. So something that really is clearly special to that place. Um, I went to a performance, a dance performance of an interpretive dance group down in Brown County Park. They're called Windfall, Windfall Dancers. And I didn't know what to expect because it's, it's interpretive dance in a park. Um, and they did, a little workshop earlier in the day where they took 
people who wanted to come on a little hike through the woods. And then they had a performance in the evening. And it was a really clear, well-articulated well um, explanation of the connections between the park environment and the dance that they created for their performance. And they even involved the audience, the people who'd gone on the, on the little hike. There was some choreography. And in the course of their performance, they continually asked the audience for their opinions, what they thought, for, for participation. And so it was a really lovely example of how to do a performance that you may not on the face of it think would, would work well in a park environment. It was really, it was, it was lovely. Um, most recently, I went to Versailles State Park uh, to see um, the project is called Seasons of Versailles. And there's a painter, Debbie Black, who is four times each season, spring, summer, fall, winter. She has an event where she's doing a collaborative painting. She has a, a park scene, and over the course of about three hours, she, working with people attending who want to help paint the scene, and at the end of this year, she's going to give all these paintings to the Nature Center for display. And so this is another four-part series, um, or a, a series event, so it's not just a one-off. Uh, a lovely thing about that event was that it was a collaborative event with the park staff. So they had a big tent set up, and the park staff used it as an opportunity to talk about the centennial uh, of the park system and to talk about the work of the Indiana Arts Commission to help bring this, uh, this, all, this pro all these projects to pass. And they also had a chance to give hi the history of the park. So uh, the p assistant park uh, property manager, uh, the interpretive naturalist, did intros that led into this arts event. And it was a really, it was a community uh, event. There were a lot of people um, who were part of the Friends of uh, Versailles State Park who were there. And uh, that doesn't always happen, but the artists worked closely with the park staff, and so that's how that came to pass. So you never know what you might be able to come up with when you uh, actually working with park staff until you talk to them. The last thing I want to say about these events is that you saw this a little bit in the signage. Acknowledging su the support of the IAC and the DNR in general and the park that you're working with is huge because a lot of people who may be attending an event that you design may not understand why they don't have to pay to do it. And they may not, they may not know that there is an Indiana Arts Commission. Uh, they may not know that this is uh, a funded project. And so it's, an, it's an, a really, it's a golden opportunity to do some really good arts advocacy. And the best, the best acknowledgments that I've seen are, are unapologetic and straightforward. So the people who are there having fun who say, as I've heard, this is really great and I can't believe that it's free, that's the opportunity to say, we're happy to be here because we got funding from the IAC and we're hosted by the DNR in Brown County State Park. So that's, that's kind of huge. The last thing I want to mention, and this is in your packet, if you'll note, this is a, a map with all of the state park properties listed. And if you'll take a peek at that. So there are three parks that have red highlighting. Those are in high demand, not just in terms of usage, but also uh, for Arts in the Parks funded projects. And Paige will talk about this in more detail, but because they are in such high demand, uh, if you want to design a project for a park, if you want to do it in Brown County or Fort Harrison or Indiana Dunes, you should have a, another option because you may not get that first choice just because there's so many people who may want to do projects there. The yellow highlighted parks are parks that need Arts in the Parks projects. And so look at those places. As you can see, there are tons of great properties here. You may not be familiar with all of them, uh, but look beyond maybe what's right at hand and think about other options. So anything else you can think of? Any questions? 
uh, if you haven't if you haven't visited uh, or checked out an Arts in the Park project, you might do that. And you can go on the IAC site and you can look at parks sites. I, having done it a bunch this year, it's really interesting to see what people are doing. And also just to see um, how heavily parks can be used in the summer and to know that you need to think about park usage when you're developing um, your own projects because you have pretty much the whole year at your disposal. It doesn't have to be in the summer. And in fact, there may be good reasons to not situate it in the summer. So thank you. Yeah. Okay. You can ask me later if you like. Oh, yes, sure. I would say, um, and again, Paige, chime in. Uh, I would talk to the staff at that park who will, well, talk to the staff. But the first thing you can do is look at their, their calendar of events. So times of the year where there's already a heavy cluster of stuff, A, it's just going to be a lot of people. But B, your project is going to be competing with five other things that may be happening at the park that day. And the staff is going to be able to tell you what what times of the year are not quite as, as booked, but you still have good weather. And uh, again, the discussion of that with park staff will lead you. So yeah. Another thing to, to consider when you're developing a program is who is the audience? Who are you wanting to target? As an artist, maybe you want to expand those folks to, that are aware of who you are. Uh, maybe you want to start working with school groups. If you want to work with a school group, certainly a fall or spring time would be more idyllic. Maybe you want to um, meet a need in the community of some sort, help help kids, um, some at-risk youth or something. Um, work with a, a boys and girls club and have them come to the park and do a project. It kind of depends on what you want to do. Think about your career. Think about what you care about. What are you passionate about? Or how you want to... Um, educate people. It could be in a park setting. and We have expanded it. It's now in a historic a state, a historic site as an option as well. It translates to different levels. So the, the playing field for the park system is, has its level of complication, but you see that there's the same things across the board. It's always a communicating effectively with those populations and, and making sure you get the information out to them. Um, but it's also think outside the box of, of who you want to serve, who you want to bring in here. It could be even during the winter time. And to punctuate information on our website with regard to this program, each of the parks and each of the state historic sites has a one pager that you can access through our, our web page. It's just under resources. So if you're thinking, oh, you know, maybe I want to, my mom's down in Southern India and I haven't hung out with her for a while. Maybe I'll do a project in the park down there. Um, there's information on the website about that park, the facilities that they have, and um, space options that they have. Same thing goes for historic sites. So there's a, a wealth of information. It, it's a pretty broad uh, program in terms of, of options. I mean, you really are creating uh, your projects. And, but again, the key themes are um, work with those stakeholders. Be partners with the park. You know, really reach out to them. One thing to note, um, before, when you're developing your project and you want to do a site visit, contact them in advance, um, and that way you won't be charged at the gate or for that visit that you want to come in. Any other questions about that? One thing I will add is that all these properties are different. They have different facilities. Uh, they may not all have full-time staff, and some of them are... <laughs> thanks. Uh, are... Like if it's a state forest, you're not going to have the same built environment that a state park it has, but you're still able to, to do something there. Uh, so there's just a real wealth of possibility out there. So you want to... Go ahead, I'm sorry. I have a question. I think it's for yeah. Paige. I'm, I'm noticing on the front page, uh, besides the change in the, that we can do this sort of sites, I see the individual artist grant program is a $2,000 maximum. Next year, yeah, it was twenty five hundred this year. I thought no, it was still two thousand. It was two thousand this year. Yep, guaranteed. 
trust me, if it was twenty five hundred, I'd be doing jumping jacks. They're like, finally, we got more money in the pot. But no, it's just two thousand. Yep, just go back off that. But the arson part is still in it. Three. three. Okay. Yeah, maximum of three thousand. Still a maximum of three thousand, and this is a really exciting opportunity. Don't miss out. It could change later. There's no match. There's no required match. And I want to be clear that if you request $3,000 from us, that can be your own income. But you can charge for a workshop. That's perfectly acceptable. Just make sure that you balance it out at the end with the expenses. So if it's $3,000 is income from the grant, maybe $500 uh, income for, that you estimate for attendees paying to come to a workshop, then it would be $3,500 in expenses. So, but this, is, this is really a great opportunity. You don't have to match it. Um, and the other thing, which I love, because I'm in the Indiana Arts Commission, is such a it's a great state agency. You know, we are wanting to take these public funds and get it back out to the public. And but we also want to support artists. So when you are developing your proposal in that budget, remember yourself. How much would you be paid if a nonprofit organization paid you to do what you're doing? Right. Put that in the budget. You know, your income for doing the work. That's important. We want to support artists in the state um, as you endeavor to not only uh, maybe expand your horizons and working with the public a little bit outside the, the studio, um, but as you get out there and, and meet the needs in the state. So, yep. Um, for, I know that everything that you do as artists in the park it can't be a permanent, you know, object in the park that stays there forever. Like, let's say you want to build a monument or something. Something that park. I mean, where would they? I mean, do you have any recommendations on whether that's uh, avenue for that would be? Um, maybe not since Arts and Parks, but maybe the Arts Commission. That would be more side by side facing, I'm guessing. That would be side by side face. You'd okay. have to talk to the the park staff, and they may have to talk to the um, uh, chief in interpretation on the state level. Um, they're very concerned about anything that would be permanent um, or even temporarily permanent. I mean, because that's all kind of subjective, right? And you know, this is, this is a different animal. This is what's so cool about the park system. We as arts people are super passionate about what we do. They are equally passionate about what they do, but the language is very different. <laughs> I mean, when somebody proposed the yarn bombing, I thought they were like, I don't have it. I mean, they were like, oh, what? I mean, it was a total meltdown, but, but we, everybody got through it. So going back I mean it's been very entertaining um, and we're actually it's been a real great bonding experience and, and the yarn bombing went over really well but we did learn no balloons ever that's a total deal breaker you mm -hmm. know it's just we're all on the learning curve so when the first year we learned they didn't want anything permanent it doesn't mean that there can't be um, some work together in a community engagement collaborative format on what your goals are and what maybe their vision would be and finding that common ground because you'll find everybody really wants to work together to make something cool happen so it would be just starting at the ground zero with that individual contact communication talking oh yeah and and starting that relationship as you are planning, thinking about your project, because you may run into sort of a significant issue that makes you take a little right turn, so that before you submit a thing, you've sussed out as much as you can about what the issues are. We have um, experience in um, social media marketing for the events, or um, tracking the metrics of engagement afterwards, and is there any requirements for the grant to be followed? We require that you let us know what the participation level is, but not with regard to electronic. Um, that would be something that you would put in your application as a, as a form of determining um, success in meeting your goals and outcomes. As a state agency, we require certain reporting measures because we are also funded by the National Endowment for the Arts. And so what we want to see essentially, we drill down, is just butts and seats. So the people are actually there. But you may want to see that as well because it's quite uh, uh, okay to be funded one year and submit an application for the same project the next year. doesn't mean that you'll get funded necessarily, but you could. And so, or maybe you want to do the project again with another funder. That could be a baseline 
for you to see, uh, you know, starting at, okay, well, I got 100 people engaged here. Maybe if I change it and do it this way from what I learned, I can get more. Um, so it, you need to, that's something that you can think about, but our requirements are actually people there. Uh, I'm going to get to you, but I, I want to add something about, you said social media. Promotion for your individual events is something that can happen on lots of different levels. And so if, if I'm going to have a paint out at X Park, I want to mobilize every tool, use every tool in my toolbox, and that may include social media, it may have be my email list, so that an individual artist is not simply relying on the park. Because individual parks may have small internal calendars, there is a state calendar, but you want to be as proactive as possible communicating with, with your audience to bring people there. And that can be social media. And should be so social media probably if, if you are active in it. Social media, the Indiana Arts Commission, because we'll then also give it to the Department of Natural Resources. So it'll be on our website, it'll be on their website, it'll be on your Facebook page, and also on a resource sheet that I, is in your packet that we'll talk about a little bit more later. There's also a regional arts partner in you know region around the state, and you'll want to contact them as well because they'll want to provide help get that information out. And there are a lot of people that want to help get you to be successful.